Hello, my name is Susan Avery, and I have the privilege of being a part of the Women of Fellowship uh, ministry here at Fellowship Bible Church. Um, I'm thankful for this opportunity uh, to be in this study uh, entitled Flourish, A Summer in the Psalms. You know, when I first heard that, Flourish, A Summer in the Psalms, I thought this sounds like an invitation to vacation with some friends in Palm Springs. That's the first thing that came to my mind. And it may not have always been exactly like that. It may not have always been warm and sunny, but we sure have found some refreshment and um, some rest for our souls during some pretty turbulent times. Uh, sort of like the conveniently placed park bench these psalms have been a place where we can sit and rest and um, find some godly perspective uh, as we've watched a, really a crazy world uh, sort of pass us by. I'm thankful for all the women who have put into this study and for all of you who have taken the time and made studying the scriptures a priority this summer. And... Um, have taken what you've learned and shared it with your discussion groups by way of encouragement or exhortation. And so I thank you for that. <clears throat> so now we have one week left, so let's finish strong. Uh, let's pray. Father, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, make us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So Psalm 51. This is a penitential psalm of David written after Nathan the prophet <clears throat> comes to confront David on his sexual sin with Bathsheba. To sum up, King David was lounging on his bed uh, when he should have been out with his men in battle and he meanders out onto his rooftop, and from there he sees Bathsheba, beautiful Bathsheba, bathing. He inquires after her, then he sends for her, and when she comes to him, he lays with her and gets her pregnant. He schemes to bring her husband back from battle, so no one will be the wiser. He hopes that if he can get Uriah to sleep with his wife, then all will be right in the world. Fast forward, after David's multiple attempts to get Uriah to sleep with his wife fail, David decides to plan his murder. Once that's accomplished, David reaches out to bring the woman pregnant with his child into the palace. Now maybe he thought this act of nobility would somehow absolve him of his crimes against humanity and his sin against God. Just wipe the dust off and let's get back to business as usual. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Never were Sir Walter Scott's words more applicable than to the story of David. He made a mess of things right from the start of this, and so much can be taught from these chapters in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. But time just won't allow us to spend time uh, going through that, so uh, we'll leave that for you to study. And I would encourage you to go back and read through those chapters and the ones following to see um, the ongoing ramifications of sinful desires met in sinful ways. It occurred to me that if we were to have heard this story on Dateline NBC, we would have been horrified. Leader of country rapes young woman and murders her husband who was a loyal friend. We'd hear things like, we must have been mentally deranged or, or he has a mental disease or he's clearly insane. We'd put this evil person in another category of humanity so that there's no possible way that it could be similar to us. They're sick and evil. Let's not miss this, ladies. 
that probably no one would use these phrases to describe a most beloved Bible character. God himself did not. On the contrary, he called David a man after his own heart. So what are we to make of this? How can this be? Maybe we are more like David than we'd be willing to admit. Maybe David's response in Psalm 51 will give us the answers to these questions. Now, one thing I love about this study is those first couple of days when we're encouraged to read through the psalm and then look at the words and how the words connect with each other and, and how they may be grouped together. And if you didn't get, your, get the chance this last week, there's two exercises I would encourage you to do with this passage. One would be to record all of David's declarations um, about God, that he's gracious, about his loving kindness, his great compassion, that he's justified when he judges, that he's just and blameless. And these are just some. The second exercise would be to record all the things that David discovers in his self-examination, that he stands in need of mercy. He's transgressed against God's law. He needs cleansing. He knows that what he's done is sin and that it's evil. And again, these are, these are just a few. Making these two quick lists um, on that first day really laid, for me, the foundation of this psalm of penitence and answered, who is God when I sin? And what should my perspective be of my sin? Keeping these thoughts in mind as I walked through the verses really gave me just a better clarity in seeing all that David wanted us to learn from this psalm. Now, let's get into the psalm. Um, the psalmist uses a great literary device to help us easily recognize the concepts he's teaching by grouping in threes called triple parallel statements. Now, the first of these six triple parallel statements is David's appeal to God's mercy, his unfailing love, and his compassion. Now, mercy is defined as God's loving assistance to the pitiful. I don't know why that makes me giggle. It just kind of does. Unfailing love is the continuing operation of this mercy to the pitiful. But he doesn't just see how helpless and pitiful and needy we are, but his compassion is defined as God's feeling for our infirmities. He enters into our pitifulness. In Exodus 33, 18, Moses prays, show me your glory. And the Lord answers him in the next chapter, saying, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Did David have this passage in mind when he cries out to the Lord here? David realizes that the only basis on which he can find forgiveness is it in the character of God and not based on any work of his own. We see this in the following verses as he moves into self-examination in the second set of triple parallel statements, which we just saw, we see David's condition. He addresses his iniquity, his transgression, and his sin. Iniquity is defined as perversion, referring to original sin or state of depravity. Transgression is crossing a forbidden boundary with the intent of serious rebellion. And sin is falling short or missing the mark. These are exactly as the Lord listed them in Exodus 34 in his response to Moses. Again, did David have this in mind as he confesses here? And let's not miss that David applies these personally. He says, my iniquity, my transgression, my sin. This brings us to the third set of triple parallel statements as David learns from his self-examination. 
Here are his realizations. The first, I am aware of my sin. Now, this is in verse 3. Now, you can be aware of your sin and still not confess it. Let's look at Psalm 32, which commentators agree is a companion psalm to Psalm 51 and refers to this same event in David's life, but probably written just a little bit later. Verses 3 and 4, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as the fever heat of summer. David knew his sin, but he kept silent. He tried to cover it up. Now let's read verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. The second of David's realizations is, I confess and acknowledge that it is sin. Now, this is much more than an awareness. It's submission, and God calls it, as he sees it, sin. By definition, sin is only sin, as it is against God's law. So when we read, against you and you only have I sinned, there's something in us that wants to jump up and say, no, hey, wait, what about Bathsheba? You raped her. And what about Uriah? You murdered him. But remember, it's wrong because God said so in his holy standards, in his holy word. He decides what is sin. So when we sin against another person and wound them in any way, it is ultimately a sin against God as they're created in his image. Might this also be referring to the fact that forgiveness comes only from God? Ultimately, it wouldn't matter if Bathsheba or Uriah, if he could, forgave David. Only God's forgiveness saves. David's phrasing does not in any way lessen his egregious sin against these individuals, but it does pale in comparison to it being against the holiness of God. David's third realization in this set of triple parallel statements is, I confess that my sin springs from my thoroughly evil nature. David teaches us in verse 5 that he completely grasped the fact that his sinful actions stemmed from a nature that was counter to God and in rebellion to him. This was not just a singular incident or a mistake that David made. In his commentary on the Psalms, James Montgomery Boyce states, David is confessing here when he says, I was brought forth in iniquity. David is confessing that there was never a moment in his existence when he was not a sinner. And as he recognizes his evil to the core, he also recognizes the need to be cleansed to the core. Verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in your innermost being. The fourth set of triple parallels show us David's need. He says, Purify me, wash me, and blot out my transgression. Purify means purge to clean, literally to de-sin. Wash refers to purifying by a propitiation offering. Now, what is propitiation? And that means um, that it's satisfactory to God. And blot out refers to removing writing from a book, sort of like an indictment that's been recorded. Now, when he says purify me with hyssop, the words David uses are purposeful. By saying and using his he is acknowledging that a blood sacrifice is what is needed. But there is no provision in the Mosaic law to cover what David has done, adultery and premeditated murder. Hyssop was a reference to a plant that was used um, to sprinkle blood 
on the doorposts in Exodus 2.22 so that death and judgment would pass over. Hebrews 9, 19 through 22 speak of hyssop being used in cleansing by blood. And verse 22 says, all things are cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. David is looking ahead to Christ being that propitiation offering, that satisfactory offering. Because he tells us in a little bit later in the psalm, in verses 16 and 17, that there is no offering that he can make for himself that will absolve him and free him. In the fifth set of triple parallel statements, David goes beyond asking for forgiveness and cleansing. He realizes the dreadfulness of his sin and its impact on others, and that if he's not renewed and strengthened, it may happen again. His desire is for lasting change, and we see this in his three requests. Creating me a pure heart. Do not cast me away and do not take your Holy Spirit. And restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now this creating me a pure heart, this is an extraordinary request by David because by using the Hebrew word bara for create, he's acknowledging that this is a work that only God can do, for it means to create something out of nothing. And it's also used in Genesis 1. David is saying essentially that there is no good within me to work with. And Paul affirms this statement in Romans seven eighteen when he says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. In the second statement, where he says, do not cast me away or take your Holy Spirit from me, David is feeling some pretty intense emotions because of his sin. But what does this mean? Scripture is clear that we cannot lose our salvation. Our sin is permanently forgiven because it is covered by the blood of Christ. David knows this, as we've seen in previous verses. Might David be referring to King Saul before him? who because of his disobedience and rebellion was set aside as king and God's spirit departed from him as is recorded in 1 Samuel 16, 14. Maybe he was afraid that God would no longer bless him and use him as king. Thus his request, um, we see, be restored in the joy of his salvation so that he can be used to teach others as we see in Psalm 32, 3 and 4, David had no joy because he was hiding his unconfessed sin. Dr. Boyce writes, his fellowship with God was broken. Sin brings sorrow. Righteousness brings rejoicing. We see that sin always brings death, pain, death of fellowship with God, death of relationships, death of peace and freedom, death of joy and death of purity and wholeness. And we know that when we are deep in sin, that there is a death of clarity and perspective. I asked three people that I know personally who have come out of a time of rebellion and sin as believers. And this is how they describe that time. The first person said it was self-focused, destructive, isolated. The second one said self-centered, prideful, sadness, heartache. And the third person said darkness and depression. Not one of them said, you know, it was an awesome time and I can't wait to go back. The last of the triple parallel statements revealed David's heart for what he wanted God to do in him and through him. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, blood guiltiness, then I will sing. Open my lips, then I will declare your praise. And do good to Zion, then you will delight in righteous sacrifices. Out of humility and brokenness, David wants to be a servant who impacts others. He wants to teach righteousness and then live a life of praise, which we see all throughout the Psalms. <clears throat> 
Psalm 32 appears to be a direct answer to these desires. He gives his personal testimony of what life was like when he hid his sin, how he then confessed and humbled himself before God, God's faithfulness in delivering and forgiving, and then finally how David's joy was restored to him as he breaks out in praise at the end of Psalm 32. Now, if you don't already have a million and one takeaways from Psalm 51, we'll give you just a few more. What can we learn from this psalm? The first is that spiritual laziness opens the door to sin. May we live as David prayed, focused on the mercy and loving kindness of a great, compassionate God, and fill our minds with truth so that it penetrates to our innermost being. Secondly, to live and walk in humility and self-examination. Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Often, when we are greatly appalled at the sin of someone else, we have failed to completely grasp the gravity of our own. Dave Harvey shares in his very helpful book, When Sinners Say I Do, Always suspect yourself first. We're so quick to get ourselves off the hook and blame others for how we may respond or choices we made. Statements like, oh, she made me so mad, I just had to fill in blank. Or if he would love me and treat me right, then I wouldn't have turned to someone else. This leads to our next application. Take responsibility for your sin and call it what God calls it. Don't make excuses, don't minimize it, and don't ignore it. Confess it to the Lord. And when you do, you'll find mercy and compassion at the foot of the cross. Run to Jesus and find forgiveness in him. Next, be renewed in steadfastness to the Lord. God to desires to do that beautiful work of creating a new spirit within us. This happens as we yield to his Holy Spirit and hear from his word. Let us not neglect his word and his work in our lives. And lastly, may we live lives of impact that point people to Christ. Like David, tell what he's done for you. Tell of his mercy and forgiveness. Tell of his ongoing deliverance from a life of sin and deception. And tell of his work of renewal as you walk with him each day. Let's pray. Oh Lord, teach us to number our days so we may present to you a heart of wisdom. May we hide your word in our hearts so that we will not sin against you. To you belongs all the glory and all the praise forever and ever. Amen.